So welcome here, everybody. Um, today we have a guest from Lund University, Alexis Perena, who is going to talk about uh, reinforcement learning and and uh, using this for for applications within uh, within uh, uh, computer vision. The floor is yours, Alexis. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Olaf. Um, feel free to ask questions. Uh, as, as I go, uh, and Olaf has promised me to keep track a little bit in the chat in case there are some questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can also ask between, because this talk will be in three parts. So we can also have small questions between the parts. Um, so I'm a PhD student at Lund University uh, who has been doing research at the intersection of reinforcement learning and computer vision. Uh, and I hope uh, to successfully defend my thesis on the 10th of June uh, with a thesis called Reinforcement Learning for Active Visual Perception. So this talk uh, contains ingredients from my research. Um, so in the first part, I'll just give some gentle introduction to some basics of reinforcement learning. Uh, that is kind of a, a common theme for the research that I've been doing. Uh, and then I'll look at two case studies. One is in uh, object detection where we have used deep reinforcement learning, uh, as can be seen here. Uh, and the other case study will be in active human pose estimation. And I'll, of course, come back to these two a bit later. But let's first uh, begin with some prime primers. Um, so we have a Markov decision process at, at its core of, of the reinforcement learning problems. Um, and we can consider this sort of small grid world example with this robot in the bottom row. So it's some sort of agent who can move around. And uh, we have a set of states, which is essentially all the locations within this game. Uh, then we have a set of actions, which in this case are the movement actions of this robot. Um, then we also have something which is called a transition function, which dictates uh, the probability of the uh, future states that you can land in by taking a certain action in a given state. So these can be visualized, for example, here that if the robot is standing in the bottom, it has a few successor states as prime. Uh, and sometimes uh, sort of this future can be deterministic, but oftentimes it can be uncertain where you land depending on your actions. And another central concept in reinforcement learning is that of rewards. So um, we have, for example, the um, plus one and minus one reward for the jewel and the fire pit, respectively. Um, and the, the goal in RL essentially is to learn to act in these types of environments, which may, by the way, be much more complex than this small game, but so as to maximize your cumulative rewards. Uh, and note that the rewards can be sparse, such as in this case, uh, where you have to first act for some time until you actually get some feedback from the environment. So now I would like to relate a little bit of the type of reinforcement learning that I've been doing with supervised learning, because it could be that many people are more familiar with, let's say, supervised learning in the context of deep networks. So let me give you a bit of comparisons to that. So if we have this case here with some image of a person on a motorcycle, in image classification, we could ask the question, does this image contain a motorcycle? And the answer is obviously yes. What we typically do is we feed it through some neural network. Uh, and at the end of it, we could have some sort of probability made, for example, by this sigmoid that then gives us the probability of it containing a motorcycle. What we note here is that this network is fully differentiable and the decision of whether or not it contains a motorcycle is soft. So during training, uh, we don't actually have to get a one or a zero as our answer. We can get 0.99 uh, or anything else between zero and one. And then we can use a loss function such as the cross entropy to encourage the network to get closer to one in this case. 
But uh, yes, keep in mind that it does not have to produce one or zero. And I will contrast this with reinforcement learning in the next slide. But before moving on, let's flip the sign. Uh, so if we consider the loss, we will instead look at some sort of maximization because in RL, we consider the maximization of rewards. So let's also rewrite this expression as follows. And this will also become clear why I do that quite soon. So now we move on to something different. Let's look at some sort of sequen uh, sequential decision making such as the game of Pong. So assuming we are the red player, we could ask the question, should I move up to increase my chances of winning? And this is a bit more complicated because we don't really know. Uh, it could be in some cases that we do know which is the correct action to take. But in general, it's a difficult question to answer uh, in a standard supervised learning framework. A main bottleneck would be, what would the training data be? So should we sort of annotate all possible game states uh, with a correct action to take? That could be possible in some cases, but in many cases it would be intractable. So what we do in RL is we operate with some sort of reward function instead, uh, which could be very delayed, such as, for example, plus one for winning and minus one for losing. Comparing to the image classification on the previous slide, this is a bit different now, because we still have a network that can produce a probability of moving up. So this is sort of a soft thing, fully differentiable. But during training and testing, we would have to sample from this distribution, which I indicate with this arrow. So we actually, we, we are not satisfied with 0.9. We actually have to get one or zero to be able to make a movement up or down, even in training. Uh, so that's, that's a big difference to supervised learning. Um, so how do we answer this question then? So the approach is to <clears throat> wait and see. That's the simple thing to do. So um, what we do is we record what action we take in every state. We call this Y tilde in this case, just to relate to the supervised learning thing, where you had this uh, loss function in the bottom. You note that uh, in the supervised learning case, we were able to provide labels. So you know, you knew that it was a motorcycle in the image. So you knew that Y equals to one in that case. But in this case with supervised uh, reinforcement learning, we don't know yet what is the correct actions to take, so to say. So what we have to do is we replace it with the thing that we sample. And what we do next is that we multiply this loss function with the reward that we obtain. And this is also now underlined to compare with what was the setup in supervised learning. Because in this case, with reinforcement learning, we don't quite know whether or not the outcome was good or bad until the end of the game. So with these few slides, I hope to have given some sort of high level connection or similarities and so on with supervised learning. And my message here is really that viewing it from this perspective, if you understand supervised learning uh, and can implement things uh, in deep learning frameworks such as TensorFlow or PyTorch, you are actually able to do the same thing for reinforcement learning. Uh, the only additional overhead would be to keep track of uh, these, uh, these rewards during the, the interaction process. But now I will um, try to do a sort of a different derivation of this intuition and let's see if we can coincide with what I have now intuitively explained. So um, the goal is to find some parameters of this policy. And the question is, how do we measure its performance? So what the, the standard objective to use is uh, this expectation over the cumulative rewards that you get in an episode when you start in some S0 and follow pi. So what do we do? Well, typically we would like to take the gradients and use gradient ascent to maximize this objective. Uh, the problem is that this expression looks a bit complicated. In particular, it's the gradient over an analytical expectation uh, which we would not like to have because we work in data-driven manners. So we would like to use uh, sort of uh, averaging over rollouts instead of analytical expressions. So we will do some sort of manipulations of this expression so as to make it more practically useful. So the first thing that we do is that we would like to rewrite this gradient of an expectation uh, in, in a different way as I will now show. So the first step here is just to identify this expression 
by definition, it's equal to the expected value of this thing like that. Uh, the next thing is we move the gradient inside and we add an invisible one, like f divided by f. Why did we do that? Well, that's because we would like to use the so-called log derivative trick to realize that what I have now highlighted is nothing but the gradient of the log like that. And this is then identified just as the expectation of this f of this product between the uh, gradient log and g. So the bottom line of this slide is that we managed to move the gradient outside the expectation to put it inside the expectation. Uh, and this makes it possible to, to do sampling as I will show a bit later on. The next thing we need to think about is what are actually the probabilities of a given trajectory? So if you start in some S0, we follow the policy pi to get some first action. Then the environment dynamics will tell us which is the subsequent state and what reward we get from it. And this process just repeats until you have collected some sort of episode like this called tau. So the question is, what is the probability of this trajectory under pi? Well, the first equality here is just that we take the product of a few things. First of all, we have the initial state distribution over S0. And then we take this kind of big product of the entire trajectory that we just saw between pi and the environment dynamics P. The next step is we use the rules of logarithms to make it into a sum instead, which is nice because now we notice that uh, it is only the policy that depends on the parameters. So the gradient will eliminate a few terms. And what remains is actually only something related to our policy. So we don't need to know or care really about uh, the initial state distribution or the dynamics of the environment in, in doing this estimation. So putting the big picture together now, we began with an objective function. We want to take the gradient. And now we have two useful things because we can move all of this together to make the original expression to something which is practically useful, as we will see next. Uh, it may still seem a bit unclear how this is more useful than what we started with, but now that we move to the next slide, uh, we realize that this expectation over this policy, we can replace this analytical expectation by trying things out. So you have your policy and you just run that policy a bunch of times to see how it goes. Let's do that m times. And then keep track of what happens, like what states and actions did you see in the respective trajectories, as well as these cumulative rewards that you obtain in the rollups. The next equality is just a mathematical identity. You will soon see why I rewrote it like that. So that is just an identity. But we will now take a small step back and think what's going on here, really. Going back to this trajectory that I showed you, how the policy interacts in the environment, if you consider a specific action somewhere sort of in the middle of this sequence, if we think about it, it should only, we should only care about what happens sort of onwards in that trajectory. So whatever we have done in the past does not sort of affect I mean, when I assess this policy at a state S2, I only care about how it fares from that time onwards. So uh, in practice, what we do is we just do a small, when you actually implement this, you replace this sum from zero to actually start from the current time step. And this, for example, reduces the variance actually, but both would work, but this is what you would do in, in practice. So, so far, we have gone from some analytical expressions to an actual way of computing this gradient of this logarithm. So the interpretation is that you have your policy, you run M trajectories, for example, a few games like that. And then you check when you took the teeth action in the i-th trajectory, you just need to store how it went from there onwards. So you would keep that in your memory somehow. And then at the end, you could then tweak the parameters to increase the probability of those actions that yield positive cumulative return, and otherwise would decrease the probability. 
And now concluding this first part of this introduction to policy gradients, let's just briefly go back to sort of this intuitive connection between supervised learning and reinforcement learning, comparing it to the derivation I just performed. So we had this setup here uh, where I proposed that function j of theta in the middle, where we take this cross entropy times the reward. And we also have the comparison to how it would look in this purely supervised setting in the bottom. So the above large uh, thing that I have there, that's the other derivation that we did for the policy gradient. Um, and I would like now to identify this expression with that sort of j of theta a bit further down. Well, first of all, in the above, we have a gradient and in the other one, we only have objective function itself. So let's, for comparison purposes, let's essentially remove the gradient now. So instead of considering the gradient of this objective, let's consider the objective itself, so to say. So now we can compare a bit more easily. And uh, obviously the rewards correspond to each other in this sense. Um, as for the policy, that is essentially then the sigmoidal output in this case of this probability of moving up, that will be your policy. And X would correspond to the states S here uh, and Y tilde corresponds to the actions A that you get. And then finally, this log of pi, that is uh, that corresponds to this sort of cross entropy thing here. Uh, and to see that, consider that in this example, you have two actions, either one, which is move up or zero, which is move down. So assume that you sample action move up, that you sample one, then the only thing that remains in the expression would be log, the log probability of moving up is what remains in that expression. And that definitely corresponds to the upper part with the log probability of moving up, so to say. And if you would then sample zero, which is moved down, then you would instead only have that log probability that survives that expression. So in summary, uh, that sort of intuitive way of looking at this the pr problem coincided with uh, the a bit longer derivation I did with the policy gradient. So um, yes, so with this, I hope to have given you some feeling. If you didn't, if you hadn't seen policy gradients before and you knew about supervised learning, then just a brief primer on their connection like that. So that concludes my first part and I would next go to a case study, but if you have any questions, we can take them between. I have a question if we have the time. Uh, so do you, um, do you have an intuition as to what, because nowadays it feels like um, policy iteration or policy based RL is kind of winning everything in some sense. Do you have some intuition in terms of why that is as compared to uh, value iteration? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I agree about what you say. So that's also, by the way, a good comment because some of those who are new might wonder what is this thing policy based. So it's good that you compare it to something which is called value based RL, which I didn't cover here, um, but it's a different approach. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that is. I mean, um, it is, I mean, it, it has in, in some cases at least it's obvious, I guess, why you should use policy gradients, it's, it's, it's a more natural way to, for example, handle continuous actions and so on. But if you're referring to game playing, for example, uh, it's not, I mean, I don't have any good intuition to why, why one or the other beats the other. But what I can say though, is that I think that many state-of-the-art methods actually do some sort of combination of the things that you talk about, where you use some of these value functions and so on to give you better estimates of, of this cumulative reward. Because the thing that I now talked about was sort of a raw way in some sense to just collect these rewards by observation. But many times you can use some sort of estimators to have some more reliable estimates or less fluctuating estimates of the reward, which would often improve uh, learning efficiency, if you will. Um, so I guess that's my comment on that. All right, thank you. 
So yeah, I'll move on. You can come back uh, to ask more if you want later as well. So um, moving into a bit of the stuff that I've been doing. So for the first case study here, let's consider the task of object detection in computer vision. Uh, the task is to localize in an image uh, all the objects in them, basically. Um, and the, in this first slide, you can see four examples of our algorithm doing object detection. And at a high level, um, our system operates by sort of looking at small parts of the image. And then it goes to different locations and detects locally various objects. A little bit like when you use your eyes to sort of search. Uh, that's, that is typically how our eyes would operate. Um, and you can also see from these images that the number of these fixations can vary depending on the image. So in some cases with the aeroplane, maybe you just have one fixation and you, you're done with the search. And then if for more complex images, it would then automatically increase the amount of computation depending on complexity. But of course, I'll go over the details of how that works uh, in the coming slides. So um, just to give an overview of how it looks, this model, um, it takes an input image, computes some features for it, for example, some convolutional feature maps and typical things which you would typically need to make some decisions. And uh, based on that, it decides where to look next in the image. Uh, in this case, it fixates somewhere around the middle of the image. Uh, and at that location, it performs its local detections and finds a person indicated with this blue bounding box. One of the things that it does is that it integrates information of what it has seen in the different parts of the image. So in this case, it sees that it's a person in the middle and it can potentially use this information of what it has seen when it decides where to go next in the image. So in this case, it decides to go down where it finds the motorcycle. And if it is the case that these large scale data sets contain some sort of between class correspondences, such as for example, if you have a person in that specific pose, then maybe that would indicate that there's some object underneath the person. Then uh, technically the model can learn that from, from data, so to say. And the model keeps doing this until it automatically says that it feels that it is done with the search of the image. Um, and at that point, it can use sort of this history of the things that it has seen to make some final nudges to its confidences of the detections. And then it is done. So um, I will soon explain more about the model. But before doing that, I would like to give some context of uh, kind of the standard approaches for object detection nowadays. Uh, which works in two parts. Uh, so in the first part, you have a system that takes an image and you propose a bunch of these candidate region proposals indicated as yellow in this figure. In the second part, you would then classify each of them into more particular categories such as person, dog, motorbike, and so on. Uh, the th system that we propose is also a two-stage system like this. But we need to look a little bit more at the part one, which is the region proposal network, which I'll now try to explain a little bit about. What it does is it takes an image and feeds it through some convolutional layers to get a convolutional feature map of smaller resolution than the input image. And what it does then is that based on this convolutional map, it predicts these region proposals, as I will soon explain. And after that, they are then classified more specifically into the different categories. So this is a sort of a zoom in version of what this RPN or region proposal network does. It, uh, it does kind of a sliding window approach where it tries a bunch of candidate regions. We can call them anchor boxes or like canonical boxes. So they have, I think they have nine different sort of sizes and aspect ratios of these boxes that it just tries kind of in a sliding window fashion. So let's take one of them indicated in yellow. You take that canonical box and try it in a bunch of places in the image, all the way through the image like that. And by the way, this happens on the feature map, but for visualizations, I will do it on the image. Um, and then you would go to the next uh, candidate size, so to say, and you would slide that across the window like that. So the question is, what do we do with all these super many different proposals then? 
Well, this is one of those. So I took a new one of these, a new size, basically. Um, the first thing that the reader proposal network does is that it predicts whether or not this contains an object that so computes an objectness score. Note that this is different from the second part of the detector, because at this stage, we only care about a binary choice, object or not object, as opposed to more specific categories. So if you have low ob object overlap, as in this case, you would give it low objectness. However, if you have a box which is a bit more overlapping, you would give it a high objectness score. So it is a way to rank all of these super many proposals that it, that it slides across the window like, uh, image like that. The second thing it does is for those regions that seem like they could be objects, you then predict some sort of small offsets because these nine canonical boxes, they cannot cover all the different variations of actual objects. So based on those, you can do them some small fine regression to get a better proposal. And then the summary of what the region proposal network does is that it takes these objectness scores and then it sort of forwards only those that are deemed sufficiently object-like, those are then classified in the second part of this system. So the good thing is that uh, it's fairly fast because um, it shares a lot of computation. Uh, both, the, the, both parts of the detector share this feature map and so on. Uh, what's less good potentially is that there is no real context aggregation because everything happens in one shot. So whatever happens in one part of the image cannot guide what happens in another part. So uh, for example, the example with a person on a motorcycle, uh, such things might not be properly handled. Uh, and you also have a relatively constant amount of computation per image. Uh, so, and uh, it related to that, it can be difficult to specify your accuracy speed trade off because you train your system and then you simply use it as it is during inference. Um, so what we do is something slightly different. We look at a deep reinforcement learning version of the return proposal network, which is characterized by the following. It's an image dependent uh, search process, including that it decides when to stop search. It also aggregates information from the different parts of the image that it has seen. And this guides the subsequent search and potentially boosts your detection accuracy and the whole system is trainable. So now I would like to go over the states, actions, and rewards of this model. Um, the state consists of a few things. One of them is the convolutional feature map from, from some generic CNN. And then we have the uh, objectness and offset predictions from the standard RPM. We use that also in the state representation. And we also have this class-specific history which I will now briefly explain how it works. So you have this image. What we do is we divide it into a set of bins. And um, this representation allows us to track what has been seen and roughly where. So after a fixation action, we take the bounding boxes at that location, compute the center, and then we integrate that information to the history. So in this case, we would in insert the probability vector associated to that detection. And as it proceeds, we insert more and more of these during search. As for the actions, we take the state, feed it to the policy, and we predict two types of actions. One is this termination action, and the other one is the one which tells where to look next. As for the termination, what we do is we make it into a vector, run it through a sigmoid to get this binary choice of whether or not to terminate. For the fixations, we note that all the processing of this system is sort of convolutional. So we, we use that to realize that we can take a soft max basically of this, this map. And that would then allow us to give us a probability map corresponding to image locations where we will go next. We can sample from that soft max. So finally, we look also at the rewards of this. Uh, and you, we're not going to go through any details. I'm just going to give a high-level sense of what this reward is doing. So it consists of two parts. The first part is essentially a reward for detecting the objects. So this IOU stands for intersectional reunion, which we compute between the 
things that it detects as it goes, and the ground truth bounding boxes in the training data. And if, if you increase these IOUs, that gives you higher reward. But we also have this penalty minus beta, which is used to balance how many fixations you do versus, you know, essentially, I mean, you want to balance the accuracy and, um, and computation time, really. So that's kind of a penalty for making too many fixations. Um, the question is, what do we do with beta? Should we use it as a hyperparameter? If so, we have the typical problem of what should we set it to? We could try a bunch and then take the best, but what we do instead is we treat it as an input to the system. So it's an additional part of the state space. Um, that allows us to, during training, sample different penalties, and then the system will learn to adapt with respect to the specific penalties that it gets. So smaller penalties during inference would then mean that it does a kind of rigorous job to make sure that it doesn't miss any objects. If we then set this beta at a later stage uh, to something intermediate, it has fewer fixations and so on. And in the end, you know, it's, you could even go further and, and so on. But that's the idea. You, you, you can then set this at inference, uh, which would otherwise not have been possible. So briefly about some of the results here. Um, we compare our system to faster RCNM, which is arguably the most used object detector nowadays. Um, and uh, the first plot that I show is um, our model versus faster RCNM. So the blue dashed one is the baseline, faster RCNM. And then the red dashed curve at the top, that's our main model really. And uh, the, the, the yellow curve is sort of a variant of our model, which is not automatically deciding when to stop, but which either exact uses one fixation, two, three, four, per every image independently of the content. And why I show this is to show what's the benefit of this adaptive termination. Because for example, if you look at this part of the plot, you see that at the corresponding number of fixations, which on average for our model is 4.0, it can be two sometimes, five other times, but on average on the data set, it was 4.0 and that gives you a improvement gap with respect to always having exactly four. And on the other hand, if you would like to get the same accuracy as our aut automatic model, you would have to use much more computation. So like seven instead of four to reach the same if you would use always the same. Um, and then uh, another thing was this speed accuracy trade-off parameter beta that I talked about that we can set it at inference. And here are some results for that. You only need to focus on the purple curve, which is us basically. And then sort of, again, this blue dashed curve, which is faster as them. So for, for the lower betas, uh, you would expect that you get higher mean average precision, which we also do. Uh, but then as it increases, it goes down. And the, one of the main reasons why it drops quite a lot for the higher ones is um, because it simply stops to search. If you have a lot of objects, and you have a high penalty, it can sort of stop before finding a few of these objects in the image. Um, do we have some questions, by the, or Olaf, no? I have a question. Yeah. Um, how about the, 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 the requirements of, for the training time? Uh, so what do you mean? So how, how long it does it take to train the model? Or? If, yes, if you compare it to, to the baseline model, how much, how much training do you need here? So that's a bit longer. Um, essentially, I mean, the, the reason why it takes longer essentially is that, you know, when you do stuff with reinforcement learning, you would have to do a, a kind of a lot of sampling typically. And um, for example, if you run faster as an understander model, what it does in training is it's, you know, it has a specific loss for each image and it sort of runs through all the images and updates the parameters. What we do is we run a bunch of these search trajectories per image during training to get an assessment of how good our current set of parameters are for that image. So it, it will be slower. Uh, I don't remember exactly the ratio. I think somewhere around the twice probably in training time, something along those lines. And the final plot here then is the corresponding runtime curve, um, which also is as expected that for high penalties, it's you know, it, it becomes faster, but for the low ones, it's doing a kind of rigorous job to make sure it doesn't miss anything. 
And uh, concluding with just one real example here on an image of boats. Um, so here we have a small penalty and the agent keeps searching a bit. Uh, as you can see. And then as we lower it, if we have a quite high penalty, it would maybe do something like this. So in this example, it even missed, you know, it can even miss sometimes objects because the penalty gets too high. And it's this sort of, you know, this boat that was not as visible, it sort of missed that in this case. But anyway, you can sort of tune it to be somewhere in between. So that's, um, yeah, that's the second part of this presentation. Um, so um, yeah, I'll switch to the next and uh, you can interrupt me if you would like to um, ask anything. Otherwise we can take questions at the end, of course. Um, so the final part of my talk now will be a, a different application, which is in uh, human pose estimation. The task is in 3D pose estimation to given an image detects the 3D poses of the people, such as in these examples in the bottom, um, it can also be from multiple viewpoints, as in this paper, um, where you should simply try to get some sort of 3D geometry and uh, the poses correct of the people. So background for our formulation of this task is that we compare passive versus an active observer in this context. So assume you, you, you have an observer, which is sort of locked where it is. It cannot change its view, viewpoint. Well, what it does is it do, do, does the best that it can with its given pose estimator to predict some poses of these people. But 3D pose estimation has a lot of challenges such as depth ambiguities and partial visibility, occlusions and so on, uh, including in this particular example where at least one of the persons is quite poorly estimated because of the poor viewpoint. So we propose to set the agent free and uh, let it self decide its viewpoints, so to say. So in this case, it moves somewhere else, thinks about what it saw previously, integrates the information on both views and gets a better estimate overall. So that's sort of a nutshell uh, explanation of active human pose estimation. Um, a bit more about the setup is we work with something which is called CMU Panoptic. It's kind of a cool data set. So they have actually recorded with a bunch of cameras. They have recordings of different scenarios of multiple people interacting and they have all of these cameras are time synchronized. So you have video streams that are filmed at exactly the same time, so to say. So you can analyze this from many viewpoints. So why this setup is, you know, it's actually quite difficult to find good data sets for 3D post estimation because yeah, it's, it's so this is, this is actually one of the only ones that exists for this where you have so many different viewpoints. Um, but ideally, you know, the motivation for the task in the long run would be to maybe have some, let's say a drone or something that could move around and capture views. But for the purpose of this initial research, it's nice to work with this because it gives you reproducibility and all of that. So uh, some key questions is like, what determines a good viewpoint and how many of them should we take? So, you know, we could go, we could pick that camera and then should we take that one? Maybe, maybe that one, should we stop? You know, how many, how many are sufficient? So ideally we should select a few viewpoints, enough of them so that we get a good estimate, but also we should stop before we move to bad cameras because the agents that we look, they are equipped with some post estimator. And, you know, from some viewpoints, they may actually give you worse estimates. So it's not even the case that taking all cameras is is necessarily better. It could be a few of them that are carefully selected that would be better. So looking at the task description in a systematic way uh, or with an example rather. So we have an agent which starts at some viewpoint and sees what it sees. And just uh, before I move on. So re recall that we have these cameras that are simultaneously recording a scene. So we can actually have like movements in all the cameras as well. But what we do is we consider sort of what we call time freezes. So now we're, we're in a certain frame in this multi-video stream. And the next time step, uh, the agent then decides what camera to visit next. And then this process repeats until it is done with the current time freeze. Then it outputs its prediction and continues to the next 
as you can see, the person moved. So it moved to the next uh, time step. And in the end, you will get some sort of sequence for this video stream of post estimates, which ideally should be accurate. We consider the task in two setups. Uh, we call the first one the single target case, where you have uh, potentially a multi-person scene, but where you have a specific person in mind which you would like to reconstruct, indicated with the red bounding box in this case. So from this viewpoint, uh, you know, it got a poor estimate because it's partly occluded and so on, and the arm even intersects the body in the estimate. But in the next one, it looked a bit better, and the estimate got better. The second setup is the multiple target task, which is to task to simultaneously, from this viewpoint, reconstruct all the people in the scene, like that. So what do we propose? Well, again, uh, this is a talk about RL, so we propose an RL model. Um, we um, assume that we have agents that are equipped with some monocular 3D human post estimator. We could, I mean, we didn't do it in this research. You could potentially think of sort of refining this system as you go along, but we keep it kind of as a static thing, pre-trained on some other data set. And then it's rather the job of the agent to adapt with respect to the potential limitations of its given estimator. So the agent decides where to look on the, this sort of setup and when to stop, or rather when to move to the next time freeze of the, so this video stream. So the state, uh, you take the, you have some sort of the underlying post estimator is a deep network, so you can take features from that to begin with. You also keep track of your current best estimate so far. You keep track of that, so you see how it evolves over time. And then you also keep track of where you have been on this, this viewpoint sphere, so to say. And then you have two types of actions. One of them is whether or not you should continue to the next time step or whether you should keep selecting views within the current time step. And we use a for misses distribution because it's a, a periodical thing really here. As for the rewards, we have two of them. One is for the viewpoint selections. Obviously we would like low reconstruction error, which is that term. And the other one is that we would like to not visit the same camera. By the way, CT equals to one, that corresponds to the case where you are sort of done with the current time freeze and would like to move to the next time step. So at the end of the sequence, that is when we give this reward really. So it's actually kind of a sparse reward here. For the continue action, i.e. the action that tells you to move to the next time step, it also has this fundamental thing of, it wants to reduce the error. But then we also have this fairly, I don't know, complex reward here, but the, the interpretation of it is that, as I said, the post estimator can be bad for quite many of these viewpoints. So we would like to keep selecting views as long as the error actually goes down because it could, it could start to go up again if you go to viewpoints that are poor. So we make sure that it should learn to stop before selecting bad things. Some evaluation, uh, we do both the single target, as I said, and the multiple target setting. And we have some baselines that we compare to. Random is you know, obviously not a good one, but for comparison, selects random viewpoints that are uh, different each time. Max Azim, we call one which takes the, this azimuth direction of the sphere and kind of spreads out as much as it can so that it gets so many diverse viewpoints as it can get there. And the Oracle is used so that we can compare what would the best thing be really. And it's uh, cheating because it actually it uses the data to check the error so that it can, it really goes to the viewpoints that by the ground truth have lowest error, but it's for comparison also. So for a single target setup, this, the task where we would like to find a certain target person in a crowded scene, this is what we get. The blue curve is our model. Um, well, first of all, you know, the errors typically go down as you have more viewpoints, but Notice this dashed line that goes for our model. That corresponds to the average number of cameras selected when you have this automatic mode when it decides when it is done. And you can see that that automatic 3.9 is better than let's say eight for the model. And this relates exactly to what I've been talking about that it, it makes sense to stop viewpoint selection earlier rather than later in many times. So that we find to be kind of an interesting effect there. 
in a multiple target setting, things look a little bit different. Uh, in that case, the automatic stopping is not as um, crucial, so to say. And our hypothesis here is that, you know, if you, have, if you should reconstruct all the people, then there are oftentimes some viewpoints that are good for some people and other viewpoints that are good for some people. So it is more often the case that you actually should take quite a few viewpoints here. Uh, as for the runtimes, uh, our model is as fast as the other ones. It's actually the post estimator that takes the most time. So the policy is adds very little overhead per, per viewpoint selection. Uh, the Oracle is in a different ballpark because it has to do as a lot of because it, it computes the ground truth for all the views, it, it is slow because of that reason, obviously. Uh, concluding with some qualitative results, uh, single target setting, we take the guy in the white shirt. That was the random view that was given to the agent. It does the best it can with the post estimator, uh, but then it moves to a better viewpoint. And mainly the stance of the person gets more accurate. And then the third viewpoint that it decides improves essentially the how close, I mean, the, the feet are essentially better positioned uh, in that. And a multiple targets thing would be, in this case, as I said, we have limits to the, the post estimator itself can have its limits. And this, this is obvious here. It only detects two other people even here. So we can only get poses for two people in the first viewpoint. But then as we proceed, we detect more and more people from which we then can extract poses. Some of them are quite bad early on, such as uh, you can see the one of the blue persons that is kind of standing somewhere like that, uh, which will improve as we proceed here uh, in the end. So I have indicated here at the end that this this blue person is definitely has improved in the end and so on. Similarly for that purple. Uh, you can, by the way, match sort of the colors of the poses to the bounding boxes in the image. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that concludes this presentation. Um, thanks a lot for listening. And... Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. Do we have questions? So I, I... I wonder if you can can give us some more some more intuition about the reward function in the in the last work. Um, in the detection paper or in in the, the final paper you discussed. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. sure. Um, so so why is it that that this particular reward function uh, would be the best? Did you try out other reward functions? Uh, let's see here. Uh, I can. So actually, um, okay, so I thought I had some slides, sort of extra slides, but, but apparently I didn't. But okay, so the question is why that reward? Well, let's go to the slide first with, with the reward. So we can have a discussion. Um, I guess I should take this one and, and uncover it. So, uh, um, well, I mean, we can begin with the reconstruction part, right? That's the main thing that we like to optimize. Um, here it's kind of clear that it should be part of the reward, I would say. Um, you may wonder why do we have a ratio, for example. Uh, the reason we, ha we have a ratio there is um, it is given a random viewpoint in the beginning, which has some corresponding errors, epsilon one. And it only makes sense to assess how much it improves relative to what it was given, mm -hmm. rather than some sort of absolute error, or whatever that means. So hence this expression for that reward. Um, then this, as for the viewpoint, uh, it was more empirically noted that it actually helped the agent. For some reason, sometimes it, at least early in training, it sort of went back to, the, even though it has a history of where it has been, it's, we, we actually, it helped to, to give it a penalty for going to the same. So it doesn't make sense to go back to the same multiple times because that would rather, if you do that, you should probably just terminate and move on. Uh, so, I mean, that was a, at least for the viewpoint. Uh, for the continue one, it took some time to figure out the upper case. So the upper one was the thing that makes sure that you stop. So you can think of some sort of error curve here. So you have a bunch of viewpoints. So first it maybe goes down when you select some viewpoints, but then it could go up because 
the viewpoint selection policy either doesn't know quite where to go and then it goes to some bad thing. So the job here is to stop that from happening or ideally. Uh, and in the early experiments, we did not have that. I think we just had it as zero or something there. So we just had a final reward. And uh, yeah, you know, it's how it goes. It's like we, we try it a few times on the validation sets and uh, then we need, I mean, it, it, what we saw was that it actually, it, it's for some reason kept selecting views sometimes more often than not when it should have stopped. I mean, ideally it could even learn to stop just from that, but the problem with RL in general is that if you have a two sparse reward, it can take a long time before it learns because there's a lot of uh, variance in your estimates then. So I guess the, the term that we added makes it more dense, the reward. That's one of the reasons perhaps why the learning efficiency increased from it. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my answer. To that. I mean, I guess we tried a few other things, but we, we really kept the main structure along the process, I would say, of this. Um, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Just quickly here, the reward is always a value between zero and one, or um, I'm not sure what epsilon is here, but so epsilon is the error for so like you know it's um, so Eps I mean so what is the error? So when you have some post estimate, you compute really the three D. I mean the distances in three D space between the different joints of the estimate and the ground truth, and then you get some in millimeters essentially the, the offset, and then by taking this ratio it's not necessarily always between zero and one, I guess, because um, if you're unlucky, your epsilon K, I mean, the error in the end could be, if you do it poorly, could be much, much higher than epsilon one even in some cases. So technically it could go outside the range, but most of the times what you say holds. So most of the times it will be around <coughs> zero. One. And have you observed any issues with, uh, because I mean, that's quite a common issue, I think, in uh, reward engineering in general. If, if you have uh, very large scale differences between your reward signals, it's very easy to kind of um, suffocate the, the weaker signals from the very, very strong ones. Is that something you've observed? Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree about that. Um, we didn't uh, observe it mainly because in our case, we don't have that thing, right? So, we, I mean, we didn't in this project at some, there was no point in this project where we had some reward, which was like hundred and another which one, which was one. Uh, but I agree in general that that's the problem. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Right. Thank you. Thanks. I had another question if nobody else wants to uh, butt in in between, but for the, um, uh, the first object detection um, presentation you did, <coughs> uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm really no expert at, uh, at vision at all, but isn't this very similar to uh, visual attention, but through a reward signal instead? Yeah, definitely. Uh... I would say that this is sort of an attention. Actually, I have a slide here actually, so I didn't show it, but now that you ask about attention, so let's look at that a little bit. So attention, for those who don't know, is essentially like where should a model pay its attention for its computations and so on. So yeah, I agree, it's, we definitely have an attention model. Uh, you could differentiate between sort of soft attention and hard attention. Uh, by hard attention, we mean essentially what we do. We go to this and that, that location, uh, but another type of attention that is often used, including in transformers and so on, is you know, more like soft attention. And if we compare, let me briefly explain what I show here. So we have two different input images. I showed in grayscale only for clarity of the attention here. So if you take the standard region proposal network, which I tried to briefly explain in the beginning of the sliding window and how it proposes the regions, this is a visualization of the regions that it would forward to the detection component. Um, and uh, yeah, at some point I could give more details about what this is, but for now I, I I'll keep it high level what it does. So what you can see is that it has a lot of white stuff around the objects. 
which is good. That is what we would like to have. Uh, but it also has some scattered stuff a bit here and there. Um, if you compare that to, um, oh, by the way, just to note, even though it has some scattered attention here and there, that's typically not a problem because when even if you forward something which is a background box, uh, the second part of the detector uh, would typically eliminate them anyway. So it would classify these background proposals at, as, as background. Uh, but it's still, of course, not ideal because you would like to remove them early on, you know. So this is the sort of the hard attention that visualization of our attention would look like for these images. And uh, it is more, I would say, object centric here. It's, it's more delineated exactly where it is. The reason why they are sort of delineated like this is because we have these fixation rectangles that are exactly corresponding to attention. So what I'm showing here really is the fixation locations that this agent produces. Um, so yeah, so definitely connection to attention, I would say. Thanks for the question. All right, thank you. Soft attention usually gives a similar thing, but it's sort of blurred. Yeah, exactly. So it could be like something like that. Um, I agree. More questions? I have a question. Yeah. So maybe I missed it, but for the post estimation, uh, how is the final post derived from the multiple views? So um, you get a post think? for each view and then you derive a better post from these multiples. Yeah, exactly. So I didn't ex exactly explain like how do we, com your question is like how do you essentially combine the estimates from the different views or something like that? Yeah. Uh, let's look here. Um, so, uh, so what we do is, I mean, we did something fairly simple in this uh, in this setup. Is that you have these estimates from the different viewpoints in some three D space, and then we took, I think it was the median median of per joint, really. So we used the median rather than the mean to, for example, eliminate a bit of the outliers. Uh, so it's it's really the median. If if you look at the sixth view, it's the median of of, of six views, or more specifically, some persons are only detected in a few views, but then we take the median of, of those views where it was actually seen. Uh, yeah. But of course, you could, I mean, the, the better thing would be to use something a bit more sophisticated in the long run than just the median. But I was just wondering if the agent's choice to revisit the same viewpoint could be to sort of adjust for this. I mean, if, if that viewpoint is really good, then Maybe visiting it multiple times would give the best tool. Yeah, good point. Definitely, um, I, I, I certainly agree. So, like, if it gets a bad view, it could go ten times to the best view, uh, and then uh, that would give it. It's. I guess it's more or less true. I mean, since we have the mean, it, if it, if we would have used the mean, then it would just be good to just go so many times and get. You know, the mean would then almost only be the best view. But for the median. Yeah, it's, it's, it's still true what you say, but the media should reduce that effect a little bit. Yeah. But good point, thanks. Would it be possible to add some sort of weighting for the agent to say how important it thinks the view is to sort of get that aggregate a bit more? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I think we even had it at some part of this, the, the loop, this sort of development loop. Uh, and in the end, we I don't think it actually gave anything. So it wasn't really better than uniform. But on the other hand, you know, when you do research, you you try some ideas at some intermediate stage of the project, right? And then you conclude that, oh, it doesn't seem so helpful. But then ideally, if you would have all the time in the world, you would like to revisit every idea that you had with the final model to see if it actually did help you or not. It's like, yeah, that's that. But I like the idea, thanks. Do we have one last question? Otherwise, I think we can all say, say thank you, Alexis, for a nice presentation. And uh, good luck with the, with the defense. Thank you. Um, the, our seminar is back next week, the 29th, I think that is. Uh, Ariel Ekgren is going to talk about art from the weights. And uh, please follow us on Twitter and, uh, and LinkedIn. Thank you, Alexis, and thank you for everyone.
Ja, tack. Stort tack för idag.